The wind blows towards the south and turns again, turns about to the north. It whirls continually and returns again according to its circuits. Whosoever speaks and says, look, this is new, should know that it already has been in the ages which were before us. From King Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to All Souls Metaphysical Chapel, and welcome to all of those who are joining us remotely. Welcome and blessings to everyone. I am Reverend Elizabeth Moore McDevitt, and I have come down here from Roanoke, where I serve at times with the Roanoke Metaphysical Chapel, and I'm a former board member of UMC, and um, I graduated from, was ordained from um, the UMC se uh, seminary. So that's a little bit about me, and I've known, I've got, gotten to know a little bit some of you, and namaste all. <coughs> Our first hymn, our opening hymn, and I'm going to ask you all to rise as you are able. Our first hymn is Praise God the Almighty. And so please rise and remain standing after the hymn, and we will have our prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Mother, Father God, we come to worship in spirit and in truth, awake and affirming of wisdom. There is solace in communing with you. We find peace and we grow in wisdom as we fellowship. Your infinite presence is our comfort and our help. We lift up our praise and gratitude for your word, wisdom, and abundance. We lift up in prayer those who are lonely and in need, those who have medical issues, those with problems with finances, those who need work, and those who need the benefit of stability so that their lives may proceed without worry and concern. Father, Mother, God, we ask for protections for our public workers our military, first responders, medical personnel, and all who help others. We pray for everyone listed in our prayer book, those healing from procedures, those with illness, those with infirmity. And we ask for strength for our congregation members who face the issues of aging. We call on all our angels, all our guides and teachers for wisdom, and we strive to be ever mindful of the needs of others. And as you help them, and as we keep them in our prayers throughout the week, thank you, Father. We pray for our communities and neighborhoods, our leaders, and we ask Spirit be present where discussions are made, decisions are made. We ask in joy for freedom. We ask in liberty for justice, and we ask for plenty and abundance in decisions that affect those who most require comfort and aid, that they seek a way to make their futures lively and good, and they make their progress in abundance and right living, and they are welcomed into community. We ask all this and more, everything that is laid upon our hearts, in the name of our wayshower, who knows our hearts best and walks with us, as we say his prayer together. Join with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. In your bulletin, 
we have the responsorial. And this is from also this is also from King Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. This is from Proverbs chapters 19 through 22. So I will lead and you will say the second line. Reverence, oh wait a minute. What we must know is how to recognize wisdom. Reverence for the Lord leads to life. And he who is satisfied with it shall die. He shall not be visited with evil. He who spares is his words has knowledge. And he who is patient is a wise man. The words of a man's mouth is like deep waters. And the fountain of wisdom is like a flowing he who keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from trouble. There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel like that of the Lord. A man's steps are directed by the Lord. Who is the man and who can direct his own way? A coveted treasure and ointment are in a dwelling place. He who seeks after righteousness and mercy will find life, righteousness, and honor. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. For both wisdom and knowledge are pleasant. Keep them within you. That I might make you no counsel, knowledge, peace, and the words of truth. That your trust may be in the Lord. He who does righteousness and justice is acceptable to the Lord. Our guest, uh, Reverend Nancy Shockley, who's also from Roanoke, is going to gift us today with a um, singing bowl meditation. And before she comes down, or as she comes down, I will lead you into it with three ohms. So become relaxed in your seat and prepare to join with spirit. Prepare to Relax in the meditation of your heart and mind and let us say three ohms. Om.
Meditation is our opportunity to be lifted in the vibration. Your mind has been free from all concerns. Thoughts can disappear. The Lord has wisdom for us, for infinite intelligence knows our hearts. Take a deep breath. Come back into these temple walls. Move around a little bit. And welcome back. The lecture this morning is entitled, What We Must Know, and our scripture is from Proverbs. And everything I've used from the Bible so far today and further on is from the Lamsa translation of the Holy Bible. And the Lamsa translation is from the original Aramaic from the Peshitta texts. Proverbs 1123a and Proverbs 12, 7b. The desire of the righteous is only good. The house of the righteous shall stand. When our thinking is right thinking or righteous, righteousness is being in the process of right thinking. It is always for the highest good. The house of the righteous, according to Charles Fillmore, is our body, housing the Holy Spirit, temple of the living God, our temple. And when we refer to Solomon, we think of Solomon as having built the first temple of the ancient Jews. His reign was during the 900s BC. He is the son of King David, who was the son of King Saul. <clears throat> when you think of Solomon, you want to think of your own head. Saul, S-O-L, solar, sun, sun god, mon, moon, or lunar, the feminine goddess. Sol, O, Moon, Sun and Moon, the temple, which is anatomically, this is what we call our temple, or two temples, the temple walls. And the O, of course, is the um, third eye and crown chakra. So whenever you think of your body as your temple, remember King Solomon. Symbolism is everything. And uh, you learn much from s symbolism, and it's the quickest shorthand that the ancients had. So, going on with Charles Fillmore, he said, you know, your body is housing the Holy Spirit. It is the temple of the living God. Our creator intended this. And he said, worldly wisdom is the ability to use knowledge. But there's more we must know, he said. Wisdom is intuitive knowing. Its spiritual intuition is the voice of God within as a source of our understanding. Mental action based upon the Christ truth within. And then he goes on and he says, wisdom includes judgment, discrimination, intuition, and all the parts of mind that come under knowing. And we all know as metaphysicians that knowing is magnetic and draws to you. Thinking is electric and can go everywhere. <coughs> but knowing is magnetic and it draws to you. And think of that as your intuition. And they say it's a gut intu intuition. And remember that your pancreas has the same cell type as your brain, the gray matter. He had it all planned out. So wisdom includes judgment, discrimination, and intuition, and all the parts of mind that come under knowing. And this transcends intellectual knowledge, book learning, 
stop. Memorization. Spiritual discernment always places wisdom above the other faculties of mind and our attributes that come from the spirit of Christ within us. The price we pay for the conscious attainment of divine wisdom and understanding is this. It is the letting go of the personal self or ego and the letting go of our own limited beliefs. That's the price. When you're ready to let go of that, you're ready for that wisdom. Paul saw the Christ waiting at the door of every soul when he wrote. And he's talking about enlightenment. He saw enlightenment waiting at the door of every soul when he wrote, Awake thou that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine, the light of Christ shall shine upon thee. And that's from his letter to the Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. This is wisdom. Old Testament, New Testament. We're trying to get it. Have you ever heard the old saying that this world is filled with too much knowledge and never enough wisdom? It, it kind of rings true, doesn't it? King Solomon, who wrote and compiled the wisdom in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and a few of the Psalms, was considered a king endowed with incredible wisdom, and he was. The book of Proverbs is a treasure to ponder. In, in the Old Testament, Proverbs contains about 500 Proverbs, but King Solomon had 6,000 to choose from, and he narrowed it down to 3,000, and then he narrowed it down to about 500. So this is not only ancient wisdom of the ancient Jews, but it's also of the area and of the people before. Um, the time of the ancient Jews. So it's, 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 it is incredible wisdom and also good advice for youth. <laughs> they need to be prepared for this complex world. So it sometimes get a it gets a little didactic, but that's, that's where you're teaching youth. Sorry, young people. <laughs> Socrates once said, and I think I know someone in here who loves Socrates, because he walked and talked and told stories, asked questions. Socrates once said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. <laughs> I thought we just said that knowing was magnetic. Ah, but that was Socrates. And he was teaching people about intellectual knowledge and argumentation and proofs. What we're looking for is truth. So when when you are getting to know, you're going to want to know truth. <clears throat> if we're enlightened just the least tiny bit, we can recognize when wisdom is placed in front of us. We can recognize a wise person. We realize that wisdom is there for us to look into and to use, consider perhaps, as events unfold. I have to be wise about this. I have to really consider all my options, you know. And, and, and you're truly going back and forth, trying to discern what resonates with you. And sometimes we have to pray about things. And sometimes the wisest thing to do is simply experience peace in the quiet of our inner being. And it comes to us in intuition, excuse me. What is it that we must know? And since we Well, in Proverbs 4, verse 5, it says, Get wisdom. Get wisdom and get understanding. And turn not aside from the words of mouth. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will preserve you. Love wisdom, and she will save you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and with all your substance get understanding so Sol solomon has personified wisdom as a feminine entity it, 
wisdom was a, sol uh, was a feminine aspect of learned righteousness. The ancient Egyptians knew that reflection brought wisdom. And the moon, the feminine symbol for the goddesses and feminine wisdom was reflected light. So it was processed by the human heart and mind, not just bright sunlight shining down. It was interpreted for each individual and each unique experience. Wisdom is also known as Sophia. For Sophia, the woman's name, it became a woman's name. Sophia is the Greek name for wisdom. It is good for us then to bear this in mind, for we are to incorporate this personage, this feminine wisdom, within ourselves. Let us not think of wisdom as an abstraction. Just as we don't think of the Holy Spirit as an abstraction when we think of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit is therefore part of us. So let us make wisdom part of us and have it be alive like the Holy Spirit, alive within. Spirit is well, I mean, spirit is well is not an abstraction and neither is wisdom. Both become, by your choosing, both become personal. Why must we know wisdom? What good will it do me? Hmm. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 12, it says, I wisdom. Now, wisdom is talking in the first person now. She's come out and she's talking to us. I wisdom have created prudence and I possess knowledge and reason. Aha, wisdom is now speaking in the first person to us saying when you're careful and practical, you're able to use knowledge and think things through. You're able to use your reasoning, which makes life easier, worthwhile, more abundant, less hassle. Okay, here's another question for you. Who says we have to know wisdom and what if I don't want to know it? In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 20, wisdom leads in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice that I, wisdom, cause those that love me to have hope and I will fill their treasuries. I guess we are to love wisdom, incorporate wisdom within us, understand wisdom, as part of us and love wisdom. Okay, what do I have to do to know wisdom? Hmm. Proverbs 1 verse 7. The reference, in other words referring, the reference of the Lord, which is also the law, the reference of the Lord or the law is the beginning of knowledge. We know our natural law. We're going to have knowledge of the foundation of everything. The stable foundation of all that is. We must make reference to the eternal, the infinite, the creative principle, and most of all to the omnipresence of love, divine love. And once we know that truth, we begin to know. So we're merely at this stage referring to the Lord or referring to the law where somewhat intimately involved with the Lord or the law, but there's more, more to come. What if I'm just too dumb to know wisdom? Isn't wisdom just for smart people? How difficult is this? Well, in Proverbs 1, verse 23, wisdom declares, If you will turn to me, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words to you. So see, you can be divinely 
guided into the retention of everything wisdom has for you. And you can do this with acute comprehension. In other words, you will get it. You will get it. You will get it and, and it will be manifested within you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Okay, here's another question. Where do you go to learn all this stuff? You go within and seek her. Really? Now, who has been teaching all this stuff? I didn't get this in Sunday school. I didn't get this in Bible stories. Nobody taught it to me. Well, obviously, King Solomon taught this in his, in his writing of Proverbs. It's in Proverbs. His father, King David, taught it to him and so on as Jewish parents have historically been the responsible party for teaching the spiritual teachings to their children. And then here's another question. How come I have never heard of this? In Proverbs 8, 22, wisdom speaks, and this is the this is one of the profound things about these passages is wisdom speaks and she says the Lord created me wisdom as the first of his creations before all of his works think about that for a minute once you ponder this statement, you realize, because this, this is a world of illusion, this is our earth school, this is our, uh, this is our mystery school, this is our initiation, this is what we're going through, this is what we're after. You see, as kids in Sunday school, we heard, in the beginning was the word, and then went on to the planets in the firmament, the oceans, the fish, the birds that fly, things that crawl, Adam and Eve, and so on, and then we were often running to other Bible stories. So we didn't learn about wisdom, and we should have, because it was created first. I'm gonna read that again. The Lord created me wisdom as the first of his creations before all of his works. Proverbs 8, 22. And what does that leave me with? What do I want that to be left with you? Is that wisdom was Mother, Father, God's first intention for us. Very first. It was the priority. It was the very first intention for us. We are supposed to incorporate wisdom and be wise. Remember this bit of wisdom of how wisdom herself, Sophia, if you want to give her a name, wisdom herself was present when his works were being done, when creation was cre created. And really all of creation, the material world, was built as our earthly school. We have to be ready for eternity. We have to know a lot of things. We have to have gone through a lot of things. We have to have made a lot of right choices. We have to be very adept at righteousness, right thinking. <clears throat> Our souls come here to gain wisdom, live this knowledge, create in this natural law, worship in this divine territory of love, and we experience healing, we heal others, we experience abundance, we share our abundance with others. We experience the splendor of this beautiful, beautiful earth. And we are to learn how to be. If we were to take chapters 8 and 9, just those two chapters, and we can read both of these chapters, we'd be able to get the gist of everything we need to know about our spiritual journey. In chapter 9, the teaching method is explained and it emphasizes how a person who is accepting of wisdom is already wise. And then all of this wisdom increases thereafter. 
while the rewards for that, as explained, are great. In Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, echoing slightly what I put forth in chapter 1, verse 7, the word then was referring or referencing if we refer to the Lord. Now in chapter 9 it says the reverence one letter is changed the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The referring of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Infinite intelligence if we think of it as an entity, it is a holy and sacred entity. We are in a sacred space. We are in a divine group. We are saints. This is sanctified. This lesson is sanctified. It is not your everyday stuff. It has been elevated. When you come into the sanctuary, you come up two steps. Symbolism. Symbolism. <coughs> In Proverbs 9 and 10, where it echoes chapter 1, the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it goes on to say, and the knowledge of the righteous, the knowledge of those who are able to think correctly, think rightly, the knowledge of the righteous is understanding, for by her wisdom your days shall be multiplied and the years of your life shall be increased. This establishes, number one, that incremental learning, therefore, once you accept it, is always taking place within us. And number two, it brings with it the love of God to our hearts so that we may, number three, express our love of God outwardly, being well aware, 110% 100, aware of the reverence of the Lord. There's a big step that goes from refer to revere. Revering God is our raised consciousness. So why do we know why why we need to learn of wisdom? It is biblically established. We need to gain wisdom because it is of God and requires our attention so that we can worship God and live well in right thinking, in righteousness. And why did I mention that the earth school as our mystery school? Well, I asked the question, where do we go to get such learning? So long before there was King Solomon, born to the family of King David, born to the family of King Saul, there were mystery schools in Egypt. They taught their religion in a dem demonstrable manner, leading their students in a series of tests and initiations. The lesser and greater mystery schools of Egypt were the, where the lesser was focused upon the lunar goddesses and the greater was focused upon the solar gods. This explains why wisdom in Solomon's writing is a she. Reflection. I can remember as an educator back in the early 90s, oh, Johnny can't read. Janie can't read. We're having a problem here and we don't know how to solve it and they've been trying to solve it and they still haven't. So, what happened was they did studies of the homes of the children who couldn't read. Those homes did not have a kitchen table and chairs to sit around it. Those homes didn't have any books and those homes were where people, the parents and whoever else was there did not read to the children when they were little. Really? 
because we have to get this when we're young. Mom started working outside the home. Cause and effect, cause and effect. You see it there now, right? Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, when he was a student at, he was a student in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania at the Crozier Seminary. And in 1950, he wrote a very interesting es essay on how Christianity developed from the mystery schools. He said Christianity was blossoming under the leadership of apostolic teachings, the apostles. This is before Constantine. And because the Roman world was awash in diversity due to so many conquered cultures and because Rome under Constantine, once Constantine came to power, required constant care and tending because he couldn't decide whether he wanted to be in uh, Turkey or the uh, peninsula of Italy, <coughs> among other things. Um, constant, uh, you know, nobody was really paying attention to what was happening with how people were believing. Um, but the people there had a, an emotional and a spiritual hungering, and they gravitated to Christian hope, he said. In his essay, he went on to say, the influence of the mystery religions on Christianity was thorough. And now he's talking about Osiris and Isis and Horus. And he was, uh, King was very, um, very astute about all of his uh, observations. He had gone all the way back to the um, great mother goddess or the magnum mater deum which went back to the matriarchal societies and he brought it all up and it's probably one of the most thorough um, um, and you can look it up on his uh, papers you can look up Dr. Martin Luther King and get this um, and he went all the way up to the council of Nicaea 326 AD and he notes in this paper how all the pagan themes were repeating. But the wisdom traditions, the ageless wisdom, was available to those who knew that God dwelt within the hearts of man. The soul was eternal. The Jews had not really come to terms with that. The soul was eternal and there was healing through the power of the spirit that it was real and prayer was fully relied upon and with Christ's teachings there was grace and some of the what you'll find you'll, you'll find it in Islam and you will find it sometimes in some ancient Judaic writings and sometimes you find it in the Talmud of the Jews. There was no forgiveness. How can we survive if we can't forgive ourselves and forgive others and ask others to forgive us? That's a dynamic we need and that's one of the biggest dynamics within wisdom. The mysteries were elaborate, but here's the, here's the thing. True alchemy is in the mind. The crucible that was believed to change lead into gold is actually our ability to hold thoughts and faithfully know that an energetic message to the universal creative mind bears fruit in manifestation. Our conscious awareness makes the realm and result of our knowing. Conscious awareness makes the realm and the result of our knowing and the about 200 years into at this time. The modern era gave us archeology, span paleontology, cryptology, and um, we were able to decipher ancient languages. And we think it's a sudden discovery that, oh, how 
lucky, you know, when it really was and is, and we know it, it really is divine timing. It is no coincidence that the Rosetta Stone was found when it was about 148 years ago, and that it was deciphered about 50 years after that. It was no coincidence that Napoleon's army found the Sphinx. It was no coincidence that the city of Troy was unveiled by Carter to prove Homer's stories. And it's no coincidence that the tombs of the pharaohs were entered and cataloged. When these budding archaeologists got over plundering everything, they realized every inch of the wall ceilings, floors, columns, and niches of every tomb, temple, and palace of Egypt was covered with pictographs, artwork, hieroglyphs, murals, symbols, and yes, wisdom. Wisdom. In their enthusiasm, and they're always looking for gold. In their enthusiasm, they thought this, this was graffiti put there by the workers and slaves who built these magnificent structures. Thankfully, when the Rosetta Stone gave us the wisdom placed there by the ancient Egyptian priests and initiates, we were able to learn from it. Yay, we're able to learn. Now, we should have learned already from having read chapters eight and nine in Proverbs, but before you got to chapter eight, you're probably bored with all the didacticism. Sorry, but it's there and you know it now. It is the higher mysteries where to aspire to. And there they all were in plain sight. Because it says, the house of the righteous shall stand. Nobody's bombed the pyramids yet. And that's where all the wisdom was set out for us. The house of the righteous shall stand. Confirmation that God is never far away. Think of all that was discovered right there and what was thought to be graffiti. That house still stands. God is within us, every one of us. We go within to have our relationship with our Creator. We invite wisdom to enter in. Our souls are eternal. Our thoughts and words create. Our Creator loves us. And we are all connected to each other through space and time. Fear is an illusion. And so is time and space illusory. And everything happens simultaneously. When King Solomon was presented with the legal case of two mothers claiming to be the mother of one baby, he had the wisdom to step away. He stepped away from human judgment. And instead, he utilized wisdom and he went into the heart of a mother and therefore that is why he presented the solution as summoning a soldier with a very sharp sword to do the honors of dividing the child in half one for each well the woman who was not the real mother became conspicuous So you see in that famous example, he took himself out of the equation. He took himself out of the con conundrum as a judge. He took himself out of the whole realm of judging and he allowed wisdom to take the floor. That is why we are often told by new agers and metaphysicians and psychologists and I don't know, people who ended up on the Oprah show, <coughs> And that is why we are not to react. We are to observe and then respond 
if a response is necessary without judgment. And then let wisdom come in to do the work. Let wisdom to come in to inform the situation. And I'm going to leave you with some quotes from one of my favorite little guys with frizzy hair, Albert Einstein. He said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Let us not forget this gift. And when you hear somebody say, oh, don't respond to judgment, understand how Solomon put that to work. He also said, I'm talking about Einstein now and not Solomon, but he might be a reincarnation of Solomon. He says, I did not arrive at my understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe through my rational mind, but through my intuitive mind. That was a great leap forward for science. He also said, the more I learn of physics, the more I am drawn to metaphysics. So what we all must know is this, wisdom is available to us all, all of the time.